thank you for joining us. One second, and we can start. Pull up for everyone. As I was saying, it's a pleasure to um, see many of you, even in, in mid-July. I think you will all agree that this is a very important topic. It is certainly uh, a core priority for us at the European Social Insurance Platform and at MEDEF. Um, and I will explain uh, what our um, uh, EZIP and MEDEF are and, and what is the overlap between the two and how the two are uh, mutually, um, I would say, reinforcing. And we can begin. So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first webinar um, of uh, the European Social Insurance Platform and MEDEF, the Medicines Evaluation Committee. Uh, my name is Yanis Natsis. I'm the director of the European Social Insurance Platform. What is EZIP? EZIP is um, the, the voice, the umbrella organization that brings together the national statutory uh, social security institutions in 17 countries uh, plus Switzerland. And of course, for the purpose of this webinar, we will focus on pharmaceuticals. But EZIP, the European Social Insurance Platform, covers many more areas, including pensions, social protection, employment benefits, family benefits. Essentially, our members are what we call very simplistically, I would say, the national payers, uh, the organizations that truly embody what makes, in my opinion, Europe unique. Social protection, our solidarity, our social security coverage. And of course, then there is MEDEF. I'm also the coordinator of the Medicines Evaluation Committee, and I will introduce in a bit um, one of the chairs uh, who is with us today, one of the chairs of the Medicines Evaluation Committee, MEDEF. Um, and of course, there is some overlap between EZIP and MEDEF, but there are also some organizations um, who are only MEDEF members hosted by the European Social Insurance Platform here in Brussels. Why are we organizing this webinar? This webinar is because we published a couple of weeks ago and we presented also to the European Commission our very detailed amendments to the uh, fundamental pieces of EU legislation on the marketing authorization system in Europe. We're at this point where by the end of this year, if everything goes well or if there is a, a bit of a delay, we will see um, uh, an unprecedented and very significant initiative coming from the European Commission looking essentially at the way we approve medicines in Europe. Do we know enough for the products that we approve at the time of the approval? Um, do we know, are we asking the right questions? Do we set the bar high enough in terms of the evidentiary requirements? I think you will agree that these are essential questions for public health, for patient safety, uh, but also questions that the, whose answers have clear implications for the healthcare systems and, of course, the sustainability of the healthcare systems. Um, and we're here today to talk about the significant evidence gaps. The significant evidence gaps, and I will, uh, will let my, our expert speakers to analyze further what we mean by evidence gaps and why those gaps are important for what we call downstream decisions, namely by health technology assessment agencies, but also pricing and reimbursement authorities and the national public health care payers. Enough from me. Let's move on and, and, and meet our experts, uh, MEDEF and EZIP members. As I see them on my screen, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Ermish. He is a specialist from the National Association of Statutory Health Insurance Funds in Germany, GKV. I think we all know um, uh, GKV. Welcome, uh, Mikael. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Anja Schiel uh, from the Norwegian Medicines Agency. Anja, uh, I think you've seen her in many different fora because she has a pretty diverse and important expertise. She's the lead methodologist, and I'm looking at my notes to make sure I get it right, and statistician uh, with tremendous experience in regulatory approval processes, but also in the HCA um, uh, environment. And actually, she's also the team leader of the international HTA team in NOMA. As I said, NOMA stands for the Norwegian Hi. Medicines Agency. Welcome, Anja. Great pleasure to have you here. Anna Nachtnembel. Uh, Anna, she comes from Austria. She is uh, the um, senior HTA expert with 
the DSV, the SV, uh, sorry, the S, uh, sorry, I get confused. <laughs> DVSV, I'm also new with my membership, so I'm, I'm learning the acronyms, which uh, stands for the Austrian Federation of Social Insurances. And last but not least, from uh, Sweden and the Dental and Pharmaceutical Benefits Agency, we all know it more simply by TLV, Johan Pontein. And I'll actually hand over to Johan because uh, Johan doesn't only work for uh, TLV in Sweden, but he's also one of the co-chairs of MEDEF. So please, Johan, explain to us what, what is MEDEF? A lot of people are not familiar with what the forum is. Over to you, Johan. And please, uh, the rest of us, if we can uh, simply mute uh, our microphones to make sure that there is no uh, disruption. Thank you, Yanis, and thank you for, for this invitation. And... Uh, also, thank you all for, for attending. It's an impressive number of people who are interested in this in the mid of, of July in a heat wave. So, uh, and that is very, very comforting for us, of course. MEDEV, uh, I would like to present as a network with 22 uh, organizations from all over Europe, uh, uh, EU plus Norway, I should say. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, we are a mix of uh, um, um, insurance um, associations at a national level and national payer organization and either payer and um, uh, an HTA organization. So, so um, a very lively network and our, our idea is to uh, mutually get uh, a good idea of what is uh, happening on the policy areas for for pharmaceuticals and, and reimbursement and uh, uh, to uh, of course also do a bit of horizon scanning on new products so we have at least one part of of our activity that is really very specialized and and uh, in depth in the the various products and we have a other other leg that goes to towards understanding policy and trying to pronounce a little bit what the interest of the uh the the payer community is really we we, we often brand ourselves as payer communities and uh, some people say that we should be looking at ourselves more as buyers I don't think that the, the word around us is really ready for that uh, that change of brand, uh, but I think it's an important mindset to see that we are also uh, we're here in the interest of patients. We're here to make sure that we get um, the most uh, care possible out of the money that our, our, our governments are spending on on health care. Uh, and we're eager to to make sure that there is an equitable access of efficient medicines. Absolutely. Thank you, Johan. And just to clarify, Johan, Mikael, Anja and Anna, they're all um, uh, MEDEF members and uh, some of them, for instance, uh, Mikael and Anna are also members of um, EZIP. Um, actually, I'll come to you, Anna. Um, why, why are we concerned? Why is our community concerned by these evidence gaps? Um, and and if you could explain to us what is the, what do we mean by those evidence gaps and how do they really impact the uh, decision making um, process in real life and why does this in the end this affect patients? I or think uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you also for inviting me and the possibility to speak um, on behalf of the DVSV here. I think like um, Johan has uh, pointed out already in his brief introduction is that we have to decide on behalf um, of the interests of the patients. So everything is about that. It is our responsibility somehow, to distribute the money to those medicines that work and that uh, provide a true added benefit. And what we see right now is that we increasingly experience uh, the issue that at the time um, when we receive an application and when we have to assess and ultimately also to decide uh, whether we want to allocate funds to a new medicine, the evidence 
just not suffices to derive an informed decision. So what we can do then now, we can say either no, I think this is the, the well-known dilemma uh, payers are facing. We can, say, we can say no to a potentially beneficial drug, but we will only know uh, later on, um, probably after years of the marketing authorization and after reimbursement has already been granted, whether it works out. Or we accept all these uncertainties and don't know what we will actually get for our money. So I think we have to decide nevertheless. And this, of course, poses uh, the difficulty in uh, finding the right choice. Thank you, Anna. And Anya, over to you from your experience. And, and, and you have, uh, as I said, diverse experience also from the regulatory processes, but also in the HDA world. Um, do do does our community, does the HTA community, do the regulators want to say no to um, uh, decisions that really affect uh, patients' lives directly? No, I think neither one, uh, no one in the system really wants, wants to say no. But um, there are some fundamental differences. And despite uh, many always saying, well, um, you are looking at the same data, so how can you have different decisions? Uh, the problem lies exactly in understanding the different de decisions. Um, deciding on a benefit risk is pretty much an absolute uh, position. So either you believe there is some effect or there isn't, and it outweighs any risks. The magnitude is secondary. Uh, on the HDA side and the payer side, the magnitude is not secondary. The magnitude actually is really very, very important. And that's why you need relative information. And there's this, this um, increasing discrepancy between the, the approach of the absolute perspective that regulators uh, bring to the table versus the relative perspective that HDAs have to bring. And it really isn't as simple as saying, well, why don't you just accept that um, there is maybe a benefit? Because as Anna already highlighted, on the HDA side, when we make a decision, we are actually making a decision to use money that potentially was already allocated for another patient population, another indication in our healthcare system to something else. We are actively taking away money and potentially good treatments, well-established treatments, um, if, if fish, uh, uh, effectiveness that actually has been solidly supported by clinical data and reallocate this money to something with a higher uncertainty. And as a total, one has to understand that every healthcare system has to be sustainable. And it's only sustainable when the amount of uncertainty on all decisions is kind of acceptable. And we are currently seeing an enormous increase in the uncertainty of our decisions and our purchases um, in a way, and in particular in areas where we do not agree that it would be necessary. So um, a very clear statement is that, yes, we all agree there are indications where we cannot get the evidence we, we all hope for. Um, so the best of all the possible worlds. But there are other areas where we uh, fundamentally disagree between apparently the regulator's perspective and the HDA perspective, what is considered sufficient and what should be requested and uh, considered the minimum. And the minimum and the optimal um, are very yeah. far from each other. And uh, HDAs might be closer to requiring optimum. I would say what we require is always the best possible evidence to answer the relevant questions. And you have to accept that no one is going to take a major risk if you bring very insufficient evidence for a very complex um, and a question on a big problem. So big problems need big solutions, not small solutions. Absolutely. Thank you, Anya. And you touched upon a lot of um, different topics. Mikael, over to you. At this stage, um, the uh, EMA's decisions, um, are they fulfilling, they fulfill the criteria of safety, efficacy and quality? That's for sure. But in terms of this uncertainty, what is the trend? that just Anya talked about. Um, and does the problem start at the time of the marketing authorization or earlier? 
I think Anya put it quite correctly. We see that the problem of uncertainty is, is ever growing from the past. It started with very few, very focused conditional marketing approvals for where we all would have agreed that there is the necessity to bring those products early to the market and to accept some uncertainties. And in our view, it extended over time and it extended in an, to an amount where we think it is no more, the balance has is somehow lost and no, it doesn't really start with the approval. The approval is the point where we see the, the results of, of decisions made earlier. Decisions we think that can be, well, somehow changed in early scientific advice, where we think is the point in time where companies need to know what requirements the different stakeholders have and what requirements they need to have fulfilled to well, to fulfill their duties and also to accept that none of the duties of those following with decisions after marketing authorization are worth less than the marketing authorization themselves. But all of these hurdles are, they have a, they have a role in, in the system and they are necessary in a way. And thus we need to inform everybody very early up front what is to be done and also to agree what is the, the what is the way around if it cannot be fulfilled for certain reasons at point one? Is there a second point? Can can we build a system where at least we know that in a reasonable amount of time, missing information is then given to us and given to the other to the other stakeholders? So no, I don't think it's the marketing authorization, the point of marketing authorization. It needs to be earlier. Now that we completed the first round, just to say obviously to all the participants, you see the red button, the, the video, the meeting is actually recorded. And of course, feel free to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A chat room and I will do my best to bring it, those in in the discussion. Um, Johan, if I may turn over to you. Um, the we see there is already as we speak, there is a lot of this. There are a lot of exchanges. There is a dialogue going on between um, uh, the HD community, the payers and the regulators. Is that enough? Is there space for improvement? Um, is there, are we eventually all playing for the same team or is it the different remits that make uh, people's lives harder along the chain? That is a, a very, very interesting and good question. I mean, I, I've um, I worked most part of my life at trying to make authorities speak to each other. And uh, that 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 might seem like an easy task, but it's not always. I mean, as authorities, we have our instructions from the government. We have our, our precise goals, and that is what we will always give priority to. We have started a, a, a discussion with the uh, um, with the uh, the EMA as payers in, in various settings. Uh, we're trying to find our foot. It's been, been in some periods very lively, in other periods perhaps a bit less. Uh, but certainly think that we have a dialogue ongoing where um, uh, where the EMA is slowly seeing that uh, it's no big point of making a decision uh, that is positive if the, the product still won't reach the patient in the majority of the member states. And I believe that that is something we need to to uh, bring into the legislation as well. Uh, one can certainly argue that there there is an ethical side to to um, researching products and and uh, all that that encompasses, and then bring it to the regulatory side if you haven't prepared for uh, for the HDA and the payer and uh, pricing and reimbursement process. Because uh, it's only when when all of us work together that the patients do get access to the drugs that that can be uh, potentially life uh, saving and and um, we we uh, we certainly feel a, a quite a large obligation to bring this into center of, of the discussion that we need to to collaborate all through. But uh, we 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 also. Uh, are sometimes a little bit worried that our, our views are not heard and that there in some quarters is seen that um, uh, regulatory has one task, uh, pay and reimbursement another, and it's, it's different purses. I mean, the EMA is uh, a member state, comp is a EU competence uh, after all, 
uh, the, the pricing reimbursement is a member state competence. But I don't think that that should put any 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 stop to that. Anya, over to you. Are we all playing for the same team? Is is uh, the collaboration meaningful, substantial uh, across the different links uh, of the chain? Um, I don't fully agree that we are all playing on the same team. Um, it is about uh, understanding our mandate. And for me, what is really very important is that um, if you're on the HDA payer side, and I think we, so HDAs and payers are definitely playing on the same team. We are interestingly also playing on the team of the patients and the uh, physicians mostly. Um, on that side, um, we have the biggest unmet scientific need, I would say. It's not a medical need, it's scientific need because our answers go uh, our questions go unanswered most of the times because someone else in the system interprets their mandate differently. Um, and most of all, I'm irritated by the fact that we are pretty much seen as a nuisance in the system, like as if we had no right to do what we are doing. And I would really like to point out that my government has given me and my agency a political mandate to do what we are doing. and it does state that we are supposed to approve as many good effective drugs as possible for the best and most reasonable price. That is my mandate. Anything else others might expect from HDAs and payers should be revisited because you might be barking at the wrong tree. So my um, need uh, in terms of uh, evidence that is required must be fulfilled. And it must also be acknowledged and not seen as some kind of major obstacle that we built just because we are evil people. That is simply not true. And, and I think that's a really very important message, including that making these decisions is a lot, lot harder than deciding whether I believe in a drug or not. As that benefit risk is not the same as cost effectiveness. It is very difficult to decide that you do refuse patients in your system for very good reasons. They are scientific. It's the science to do health economics. For very good reasons, you have to say no. And you have to defend that in a very different way than defending that drugs are approved on very limited evidence. And I think that's not fair towards all of us. And it's also not fair towards the patients and the physicians. So nope, I guess we're not all playing on the same team. Thank you, Anna. Very, very clear uh, answer from you. And uh, actually, you know, I want to remind everyone that um, the hashtag that we've been using since the publication of our of our recommendations, uh, our detailed amendments, actually, is show us the evidence. And the title of today's webinar is Strong Evidence for Timely and Informed Decisions for the Benefit of All Patients. And I think this is what we are all um, aiming at. Um, Anna, I want to come to you. Uh, we we very often, uh, oftentimes, we talk about this weak evidence, high prices conundrum. Um, and oftentimes that is linked to this trend to orphanize, uh, if I may put it this way, the regulatory um, framework. Uh, what is your take on that? And how are the different elements uh, interconnected in this conundrum? I think who, when we talk here about orphanization, um, I want to raise a point of the uh, somewhat definition of the unmet medical need. Yeah, what are we talking here about in the first place? Yeah, and in my impression, this is basically um, supply driven and not demand driven. So I think uh, the, we should be clearer on what the actual needs, also from a societal perspective, are. Yeah, so where do we want to foster research and innovation, and how? can we stimulate uh, their research and innovation? So uh, one of the proposals uh, was in this respect to form a multi-stakeholder group where we can agree on these areas, which should be updated regularly and also published in order to indicate industry in which areas we would like to see that. Of course, if we have them with a weak evidence, um, I think we, we we try our best, so if we touched upon that already, so in some instances when we really talk about very small uh, patient populations, it might really not possible uh, to produce uh, comparative evidence. And I think um, in order to nevertheless allow at least to uh, 
have some kind of degree of um, how this new product um, um, compares to something existing already. So that we would like to have um, similar designs in the study conduct. So we should also try very early on to, to know what has happened in another uh, um, drug, what were the endpoints which were uh, demanded there, at which time po points were they measured. So to allow us with all the different uh, new methods we are developing, because we have to cope with the evidence we have at our table at hand. But Anna, if I may interrupt you, is this, it is desirable, but is it realistic though to do that, to have that? To have what these this comparative uh, this comparative evidence and this this additional information that you're referring to this additional data that you're referring to, I think if we start early on, yeah, and the, the payers are also clearer and within an iterative process, I've uh, participated in some of them, and sometimes even at a very early stage so we don't even know what the how to describe the disease yeah what are the different stages and so and i think if we start early on and as the evidence develops we become clearer what we actually need and where the evidence gaps are so i think we have a lot of of, of possibilities to influence what will eventually end up on our tables but of course this needs collaboration and this is not only between the regulatory and HTA, but also within the HTA groups, so that we have an exchange and pool our resources in order to address all these tasks at hand. That's, that's very clear, and it, it's also good that you you raise the issue and you emphasize the issue also of coordination amongst the, the same, or within the same group, um, for instance, the HTA community. I want to come also to the topic of the uh, proliferation or let's say the trend to uh, have um, faster approvals of medicines. And I want to, to hear what you think about this. Um, this is one, in my opinion, one of the legacies of the COVID-19 pandemic that we can have um, medicines being approved faster and earlier uh, and be placed on the market. Uh, and then we can monitor their, um, as we say, or as, as it's called, their real life, let's say, performance. Uh, Mikhail, I want to start uh, with you. Uh, is this trend um, alarming, the trend of these uh, faster or the push for uh, faster approvals? Is it something that is not worrisome? What is your take on this? In our view, it is alarming. I mean, we are, when looking at the COVID-19 pandemic, it was an, well, a situation we hadn't encountered before, and uh, those situations ask for different measures than the general supply of medicines within the European markets, within our health systems asks for. So I wouldn't take too much from the COVID-19 pandemic and what has been done there, because if we extend those extraordinary measures, we're going to only ex enlarge existing problems. So this is not the way forward and however we will and nobody will, of us will, would i think will will say something different we know that there are illnesses that there are diseases where we need, urgently need therapies and we need them that urgently that we have to accept so a, a certain amount of of uncertainty this is not to be to, to be debated the question is only how do you well how do you define which areas justify these and we think that currently we are on a way that we are, the, the definition is too too big too far to 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 not not really on, on not really focused on what is really asked for so no we not ever faster authorization is not the way that solves our problems because in the end we are left with with drugs where we'll never ever see the certain results we maybe would even accept not having at the point of marketing or proof not having in the first decision, but at least want to have some three or five years on. And we currently see this trend that these, not even the questions that regulatory authorities still have on drugs are fulfilled to, well, to, 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 to that they're really answered. And we are not even talking about questions we have and that are completely left open. So, we need to find a different compromise, a new, a new line to draw. 
Thank you, Mikhail. Johan, over to you. Um, do we need to go faster? Or is the, is, the is the system flexible enough already? I think there's, there's quite a lot of flexibility, but I mean, I, I want to, to go back to, to what I said earlier, is that if it's pointless to, to bring something very quickly through the regulatory system, if you can't assure that it comes to, to the patients, uh, so that, and um, taking up a few of the threads uh, uh, that Anya and, and Anna had, I mean, we must remember that the state has all the all the children. It, it's the 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 amount of money is is limited in every state, and the willingness to pay is different in every state. And we are, are rather often uh, in the difficult situation where we have a very high met unmet uh, unmet medical need. Um, we have uh, preferably with children involved, um, uh, very low evidence and an extremely high price. And that that places us be uh, uh, between a, um, a rock and a hard place. Uh, it's, it's really our, our least favorite situation. And this can only be, be remedied by, by having uh, reasonable evidence and data and I mean all sorts of comparative studies are to be pre preferred. I'm sure my colleagues can can uh, evol uh, evolve on that on that thing. Anya, over to you on the question of the proliferation of um, fast track mechanisms. Do we need more of those? Is this a good legacy? Do we need to build on it or do we need to uh, have a critical look and perhaps scale back? I think that uh, if you just look in the literature at the moment, um, also uh, surprisingly coming from the US, there is a, an increasing understanding that FAST does unfortunately very often mean poor, poor data. Not that it's necessarily poor drugs, but it's poor data. And the way we have implemented all these accelerated whatsoever is no longer linked to uh, the generation of the required evidence in time. The, the evidence um, demands um, are shifting. So uh, if you run you know, a certain trial in a, in a third or fourth line oncology setting, then um, suddenly you don't have to confirm in that setting anymore. You can confirm in another line or you can even confirm in a different indication. And that does definitely not work for uh, HDAs because this is not how, how we are supposed to assess the effectiveness of a certain drug, and I also feel that we should be we should be more transparent. If something is conditional, then it means it is not fully assessed. There are evidence gaps already at the time of approval, and I feel that we're letting down our patients by not being honest about that they, when they get it, are actually participating in a in a trial situation without even realizing it. That is not correct. So I think it should be more precisely defined that, um, for, in, for example, conditional marketing authorization should come with a legal obligation to um, ensure that, you know, the people that get this drug under these circumstances are aware of that they are participants, that they can, that treatment is only allowed under the um, clear uh, instruction that uh, evidence needs to be collected to actually allow the downstream stakeholders assessments and decisions to be properly informed and that a conversion into full uh, approval really means that you have all the data that you need for all the questions. But this is not how the system has developed. The original intention might have been like that, but in, in reality it looks different. And that's exactly where I feel that, that um, there, there is something going wrong. And yes, we need to return revisit and be a bit stricter with ourselves, but also with the industry. I mean, yes, you can bring drugs to uh, desperate patients, but please make a difference between desperate patients and desperate people that are going to participate in something they don't fully understand, because there's a difference there. And I think that we also need to learn that there are many patients out there. Not all patients are so outspoken that they scream for, I want everything yesterday. There are lots of patients that, if asked, will tell you, I want my drugs to be well established, well investigated, and I want them to be safe. And I want to know that I get what I'm promised. And that is not exactly what we are 
able to tell them all the time at the moment. So yes, uh, oftentimes there is a lot of, um, let's say, hype or even in, in even worse, uh, a lot of uh, false uh, hope. Anna, I'll come to you. There was also the, the, the point of the conditional already raised. So the what is the situation with the, the CMAs, the conditional marketing authorizations that we see? Are we at the point where practically almost every marketing authorization is a CMA, a conditional marketing authorization? And is that um, an issue? And how is... How confident are we about the, um, let's say, the capacity of the system to really deliver on substantial post-launch evidence generation? I think there are quite a lot of questions in, in, in one pack. Um, well, I can only express my hope. I hope that it will not be every new um, authorization will be a conditional marketing um, authorization due to the reasons we have already touched upon. Uh, so having then the issue of no weak evidence without knowing really what we are buying here for. Um, in terms of uh, when we say, OK, we have these uncertainties at hand, so how to mitigate these? Um, I think um, there have been quite a lot of um, initiatives in terms of post-launch evidence generation. And this is also something uh, the payers use in order to, you all have heard of, I'm sure, of the outcome-based managed entry agreements or managed entry agreements so where we collect um, data further down the line. And ideally, the results of these um, evidence and influence the prices. Uh, nonetheless, this is also quite takes quite a lot of time to implement all these um, requirements and to agree on a study design and to look out for registries and uh, data ownership, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if we really want to tackle then the open questions later on, I think we what we have also touched upon already. We need to start really early in the um, early dialogues then to, to start thinking about these requirements. But we need not to forget this is really very time consuming. So we should be really clear for which products and which products should be uh, open to this possibility for these managed entry agreements. I want us to be a bit more concrete on the question of the scientific advice, because a lot of people will say, you guys, you are included. There are already discussions. You get to have your say uh, in the parallel, uh, parallel joint scientific advice. Um, there is already this discussion. I know we touched upon it earlier, but I want to go a bit more in depth. What exactly more would we like to see? What would we like to see be done differently? Also, for instance, by the EMA in this dialogue with the payers and the HCAs. Who wants to go first? Mikael, shall I start with you then maybe on this? And then over to Anya. Well, why not? Um, the first thing is to, what I already said, I think, uh, is we need to be heard. We've got certain things we ask from, from a data set we want to Want to have to have our questions answered and we want to make sure that well the ones that will bring the drugs to the market are aware of these issues and will have time to tackle them or to decide how to, and to decide how to tackle them that's the first thing the second thing is that we might even be able to design a data set that fulfills all needs because of course um Regulatory authorities can decide on benefit risk ratio in a, a placebo trial. They even seem to be able to decide within a single arm trial, even though we don't uh, always understand how they did that. But at least that's their point of view. But we are not. We need comparative trials. We need comparative data. And on the other hand, regulatory authorities can also decide on comparative data for their questions. So maybe in some time, some cases, it might be more wise to design comparative data from the beginning and therefore fulfill all needs. And that's something we need to, well, we need to talk about as early as possible, preferably before phase three trials started, simply to make sure that it can then be accommodated. And yes, we are aware that in the end there are business decisions to be taken by companies and some may decide to well not answer our questions but at least then why, it's, why it's... is that Mikael is it is it I've heard over the years in Brussels I've heard from many that they say that for instance uh, in many cases uh, scientific advice the provision of scientific advice is just a lobbying exercise from the companies I know I'm being a bit provocative but 
<laughs> I've heard it different. I've heard it in a way that people going to scientific advice already know the answers, but they need them written down to tell them their superiors who might not be aware of that. But that, that, that's not for me to decide. I mean, it's it's always a decision. When I take uh, decide to drive over a red traffic light, then it's my decision. And the counterpart may be that I'm losing my driver license for some months and have to pay a fee. Uh, a fee. That's 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 the decision I'm taking because at that moment I well, validated higher to say I need to go faster. And it may be a wrong decision. And I may find out that it was a wrong decision, but it's me to decide. And the same applies here. A company can always decide to say, well, we don't want to do that because we risk ABC or it costs that amount of money. And thus we risk in the end having a no by the payers or having a controversial discussion with the payers. But what we do not want to hear is, well, we would have done it if we would have been aware of what you asked from us, but we weren't. And so how can you now punish us for not knowing? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's very clear. That's my point. Anya, I see you nodding. Please go ahead. Give us a reality check a bit. Well, okay. I mean, from, I've been spending enough, yeah, enough time with scientific advisors and also with uh, parallel scientific advisors, and I would say all of the um, descriptions are correct. So yes, uh, we have the ones that come and they just want to uh, get a written recheck of that they have read every guideline correctly that everything they are proposing is in principle acceptable even though uh, we might on occasion quite frequently tell them that from a scientific viewpoint it's it's the absolute bare minimum and um, we would actually like to see more you have also the kind of people that come and um, as you say lobbying they, they just come to tell us what they are going to do they're not interested even in any <laughs> information from our side or any opinion because they will ignore it. Also, that, that kind of uh, advices. You also have um, a certain number of usually small, medium enterprises or academics that are coming for the real purpose. They have a scientific discussion with us. They do understand that we have um, a vast experience with everything that doesn't work. That's what we always say. We know exactly what doesn't work. We don't know for sure what will work, but we can tell people which ways will lead to disaster. And um, it's it's wise to listen, but everybody has their own you know, right to, to completely ignore whatever we say. And um, I've heard from many that this is exactly the point they would like to see changed. They want this kind of advice to be legally binding. But this is not binding, about how the European, yeah, this is not how the European Commission has set up the entire system because this would be really us as regulators or HDAs or payers becoming responsible for the development. The moment you tell a company you have to do this trial, they will pin you down and say, you told me to do this, now I want you to say yes which isn't the same thing because just because we tell them you have to do this doesn't mean that we say yes in the end, but this is the logical conclusion. And that's why it's not legally binding. And it's also difficult because if you make something legally binding, then there's an awful lot of strategy coming into the picture. And we are heavily accused anyhow, all HDAs are accused consistently that we make our system assessments not objectively, but with the sole intention to get the lowest price, which isn't true. It's quite simply not true. We don't decide on prices at NOMA. We inform someone else who has to make a decision. And then that other person tells our pricing and procurement agency to negotiate a price. We don't, we don't work to get the lowest price. We work to get the best possible uh, basis for some someone else to make a decision. That is our, our task. And when you start putting in legal implications, then you start getting incentives that are equally negative for us than they have been for the industry. And, and I think that's where the, the, the problem lies, because if we really, if we really want to change the system, then we have to start at the very beginning. And that is when we decide which kind of drugs we want to see developed and do not leave it up to the industry and simply refuse to accept anything that we didn't ask for. 
But then we need to be the drug developer. Then the European Commission has to take on the role as the sole driver of pharma development in Europe. And they are not going to do that. So as long as the industry has the right to decide what their business model is, we cannot have this legal obligation somewhere in the system. It's going to be, it, it would be extremely difficult and it would probably just be um, a field day for any lawyer in the European system because they would just, you know, celebrate the day we were so stupid to make this because we're going to all sue each other all day long. Yeah, that's that's a good reality, a reality check. We have 15 minutes to go. I see a lot of discussion going on also in the in the chat room and I see an interesting question. Um, it's it's funny that we, this is a, a essentially let's put it this way um, a payers uh, webinar, but we haven't so much talked about prices yet. And there is a question that uh, caught my attention: Would we accept higher uncertainty if we were to pay lower prices? Who wants to take this, Mikael, and then Anna perhaps? Would and you... Johan, yes, I have a question for you too. <laughs> maybe maybe I can can change the question. Would you accept taking a, 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 a flight in a plane where there is a 50% of chance that it falls down from the sky simply because it's cheap? Probably not. And I mean, that's that's the question. Of course, in the end, we are in a, in a negotiation system. And as we all put in the beginning, nobody wants to say no and we have to defend every time we have to say no and so there are always we come to a point where in the end we are negotiating about is there a possibility to adjust the price so that we are able to well to justify why we take the uncertainty but that's not the situation we're aiming for the situation we're aiming for is security and then applying an appropriate price to the secure information and we cannot design a system aiming for a worst case. We should design it so that we have a reasonable chance of getting what everybody needs. Johan? You need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I think it's an interesting proposition. We have discussed this internally quite a lot because if the alternative is to turn down something that is potentially good, um, uh, and we said perhaps we do want to, to pay according to the level of evidence that there is, um, to start with a, a low price for something that's promising but doesn't have that much uh, uh, of evidence, of course, we don't want to be in uh, in a flight that uh, uh, that falls out of the sky. But if we believe that the safety aspects are reasonable and there is a, a very high unmet medical need, why not? Let's together build the evidence, and when there is actually enough evidence, then we might be be prepared to pay full price. But we also have to 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 turn back and look at a little bit at ourselves. And I don't know, I won't speak for the other authorities. This has never happened at TLV. We we haven't ever sort of accepted a higher price based on better evidence, uh, to my knowledge at least. So that's um but it's definitely uh, 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 one of the the um, the ways that should be explored because it leads you out of what I was pointing at previously. Uh, high unmet medical need, low evidence, very high price. It does become a little bit easier to to say, okay, let's build the case for this together with real world data. Um, so I, I think this is a, a, a this is a piece that we need to explore at some point uh, if if we don't get a better situation to start with with evidence. Because one needs to remember the the all the the whole discussion of real world data, the whole discussion of conditional approval is due to the fact that they the 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 studies that the the uh, the pharmaceuticals come to the market with are not sufficient for our decision making. And there is a trend for those to be to become even more insufficient. Unfortunately, it's, that's the problem. E exactly. That's. Uh, and also, you should remember that there's, I mean, conditional approval, the, the, the number of those who have been revoked is very, very limited. Anna, over to you with the same question, please. 
Yeah, I think there's a good reason why we haven't talked about prices yet, because in my understanding, this is the elephant in the room. So, um, we're talking here about, oh, we have proposed um, adjustments to the legislation, which will inevitably influence and in the, the downstream pricing and also the decisions. But of course, it's uh, directly the member states' um, remit to um, decide on this. I think this is the reason on that. Um, as well, I think my colleagues have already pointed it out, there is no clear yes or no uh, answer to that. Uh, but of course, I think if we take first the risk um, of reimbursing a product with an uncertain added benefit, and of course, the higher the price, the higher our second risk is in terms of financial risk and spending money on an ineffective. So it might sway, of course, the decision if the prices are reduced. And as the evidence develops, yeah, then as uh, Johan already said, then we can probably talk about um, other um, incentives in terms of probably raising the, rise, uh, the prices. Thank you, Anna. And Anya, I'm aware of NOMA's mandate, but I want to hear what you think. Um, I think we have to uh, clearly differentiate between the uncertainty on the effectiveness and the uncertainty of the reimbursement decision. These are two very different things. So uh, yes, if I can establish effectiveness, relative effectiveness of a drug, then I still say no if it's too expensive. Then it's only a matter of negotiations. If the price is low enough, I will accept it, even if there was a, an uncertainty around the true magnitude of the effect. We are quite often talking about something where we don't even know if they are effective and they come with high prices. That's the situation where, you know, that, that's almost a guaranteed no uh, to start with, because that's, that's really where the problem lies. So if we fix the uncertainty around the relative effectiveness by um, improving the evidence base so that, you know, the, the, the question isn't, is it at all effective? It is. Is it moderately or um, rather well effective? Um, then we are talking business price wise. Before that, we are talking black and white, yes and no. And reimbursing something um, uh, that, that might not be effective or not effective enough. That's the other point. Effective enough can, can already be a problem. Um, that uncertainty is. Uh, something where most HDAs will be rather conservative, and you don't fix that with some kind of post-launch evidence generation or market uh, entry agreement or whatever, because you are not fixing the problem at hand. You, with a managed entry agreement, you can fix the problem on how to spread, for example, the risk of the reimbursement because your expected patient benefit is 20 years down, down the line, then you can talk managed entry agreement. But then at first we have to agree that your wonder drug is really a wonder drug. And if we haven't passed that point, then the rest is irrelevant. You're not going to save anything with whatever promises you make over data you will generate in six months or in 60 years. You're not going to fix the underlying problem. And that's where the, you know, where you really have to be absolutely crystal clear about which of the decision problems you're talking and have you passed certain hurdles or not. And if you don't pass the first hurdle, then price is not going to save you. Because if we don't believe your drug is effective, we are likely not going to take it even if it was for free, because we are afraid it might actually do detriment. And we, if we can't exclude that, then then no, no, then even, you know, for free isn't going to convince us. Thank you, Anya. Five minutes to go. Johan is, uh, and, and, and you are also a member of the National uh, Competent Pricing and Reimbursement Authorities Network, the NCAPRA. Um, all of you, you engage in, in different capacities with uh, the European Commission. Uh, the European Commission is working as we speak on drafting uh, these proposals. Um, what is your feeling? Is the European Commission listening? Um, is it, what is the political context uh, in light of these Pretty fundamental, I would say, uh, legislative uh, revision. Johan, unmute yourself, please. I am worried, uh, to be frank. I am not sure that they are listening enough. 
Uh, I think there there might be some quarters in the the Commission services that see this uh, the the legislation uh, on human medical products uh, as a pure regulatory uh, issue. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think there might be other quarters that are listening. Uh, and, and surely we all as member states have a uh, homework to do. We need to speak to our governments about this, but it would the best would be if if our our ideas here are taken on board before this becomes a proposal. And it also includes, I would say, um, uh, allowing um, a reasonable space for for generics, because, uh, of course, uh, if in the system there is a, 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 um, a generics portion uh, uh, in the, that is paid for, that allows, of course, uh, for for paying for some more high-priced drugs. Um, and uh, uh, also, I mean, we've heard all sorts of interesting ideas being circulated, like rolling reviews that would totally make the life of the HDA impossible and the, the payers as well. Uh, we've heard about transferability of vouchers. That is, of course, also something we absolutely do not want to see, since it's totally against the the, the legal tradition. I think in all our, our 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 countries, you 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 judge every product on its merit, and I don't need to to be more worthy than that. So I I I certainly hope that the Commission has been uh, here today, that they've listened. Uh, we've had other dialogues. We we're going on. We're pushing as organizations, both MEDEV and ESIP, to, to keep up this dialogue with the Commission. But I think it's it's a signal to all of you um, who are listening to, to speak to your governments, because when the Commission proposal is out there, uh, we all need to, to have our, our governments in uh, uh, with us when, when we spoke about it, and there will be them at the, the Council table. Uh, and I think that is perhaps also a signal that we we, we need to, to send to the Commission that sort of our community is very close to the Ministries of Finance and the Ministries of Social Affairs. Um, we would have a rather large influence on the position on, uh, of our governments, especially if we, we, we make them see uh, the impact of various uh, things here. And I mean, the, the the information is out there. We see the increasing cost for, for pharmaceuticals in the whole system. We see the, the higher, increasingly higher prices. And we also know that quite a lot of the products have, you could really ask yourself whether they are actually bringing, bringing any benefits to the patient, which, of course, all of this is um, that's that's our goal. Thank you, Johan, and I think I agree with you. I mean, it would be a, a true pity and, and a mistake at the end of the day. Now that we have this opportunity uh, in light of this upcoming EU Pharma revision, not to make the most of it and really try to correct uh, the the mistakes or learn from the past years uh, the, the in in our regulatory experience, but also reverse uh, some worrisome trends. Uh, I agree; it will be a great pity, and I hope uh, the European Commission is is fully aware. And I know they understand also the importance and the and the gravity um, of this of this uh, undertaking. Um, I see. Um, I would like to. We we are coming to an end, so um, I would like to conclude with. Um, just a few words from each one of you. Uh, I don't see Mikael. Uh, I, I think Mikael is also still with us. Your wish list. What would make you happy? What would you like to see uh, now that we do have this opportunity? This is why also we are trying to make the most of it. And we came up with very, very concrete and very operational um, recommendations, uh, detailed amendments that are actually guided by the, the real life uh, implementation of, of what we're talking about. It's it's uh, far from being abstract. It's, it's actually very, very concrete. Um, Anya, if I may start with you, uh, one minute, uh, your best case scenario, your wish list, what would make you happy? And we conclude on this. What would make me happy is if the European Commission would generate a pharma legislation that takes into consideration that there is more than one single stakeholder, uh, that there are many stakeholders and that the whole system has to work towards um, a common finish line, which needs to be access to new drugs for patients and not approval. And if they would 
put this in the correct way into their pharma legislation, then I think everybody could change their behavior accordingly and we could work together. We don't need to agree on everything, but we could at least support each other's decisions. And right now the legislation is not worded like that. And I'm afraid also that um, there are too many voices at the same time in the head of the European Commission. They will not be able to make everybody happy. They have to de decide which way they want to go. And serve also the public health mission that at least DG Santé has. Um, Anna, uh, over to you for some concluding remarks. Very briefly, because we're running out of time, uh, my wish would be to have the right comparative evidence available to make informed decisions. Very clear, very concrete. Um, Johan, and then to Mikael. Mikael, if you're still with us and if, if you can join us. Johan, over to you. Um, I certainly would would hope also for a multi-stakeholder approach for us to 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 get uh, better evidence serving everybody's needs and to to have uh, uh, um, also better um, conditions for our generics. I think that's that's an inc incredibly important market and part of this and. Uh, most of all, a redefinition of the uh, the famous unmet medical need. It can't be off and on. It needs to be incremental and also a realization that you can't be in need of something that doesn't help you. Uh, products that only solves biomarkers, give 2% increase in life capacity. That is not interesting after all. Mikael, over to you. Yes, just maybe if I have, if I may wish for two things and the first thing would to whatever is happening now should consider that the purpose for the authorization process was to protect patients and society. We just need to recall where it stems from what was the reason for establishing a system like that and we should not do anything that goes in the direction of making our system vulnerable again. And the second thing I would wish for is that everybody acknowledged that we as payers were mandated to well to, to care for a health system and for for a health system that fulfills everybody everybody's needs and thus we need to to be able to fulfill our task and not to have to decide on on wishes and things we hope for to become true but to be reasonably sure of that we do the right decisions Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, um, read our proposals. Uh, they emphasize the timely generation of robust evidence. Uh, we are all for a very healthy competition in pharmaceuticals, but also for the substantial and meaningful, tangible, if I may say so, inclusion of um, the voices and the needs and the priorities and the concerns of the HCAs, the payers, um, in early on in the process in order to guarantee that we have patients faster access to evidence-based healthcare. And I think we can all agree that this is a very worthwhile um, cause. Anja Schiel, Anna Nechtnemmel, Johan Pontein and Mikael Ermisch, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. Thanks to all of you uh, for staying with us until the very end. I want to wish you a happy summer and uh, watch this space because this is only the beginning. You will be hearing much more from EZIP and Medved from now on. Thank you so much. Have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.